Welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to usher you into the weekend of November 20, 20th, 21st, and 22nd. This is the weekend before we jump right into Thanksgiving that's happening next week. I may or may not be here for uh, your Thanksgiving show, but we'll see about that. All right, let's kick things off. Uh, vaccines. One of the biggest things that are happening more recently is the means of distribution. Um, I just read in an article on uh, NPR that Apojet is looking to uh, patent and get approval by the FDA for a plastic syringe. So uh, instead of the typical glass uh, syringe that would you use to inject, they're hoping that this plastic one would be able to uh, deal with the Arctic temperatures that are required of the Pfizer vaccine. Another good uh, news item that just recently happened is that Oxford has seen a very good result um, in their vaccine, especially within uh, adults uh, 55 and older, and seen some good uh, immune responses for uh, people who are in their 70s. So a lot of good news for that, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about distribution. FedEx has said that they're willing and able to get the job done with a medical distributor, uh, distributor McKesson with uh, plants uh, in Memphis and say it has enough kits for 44 million people. Uh, the first people to get the vaccine once approved to the uh, FDA's emergency um, uh, use um, approval uh, will be vulnerable populations, elder, first responders, you know, people who work in the medical facility as well. Uh, FedEx says more than 90 cold chain facilities are across America, Asia, Australia, and Europe and plan to open additional facilities in coming years. Um, also mentioning uh, the 50,000 dry ice shipments they already do every year. Uh, dry ice is they said that it would be cold enough to be able to package and deliver um, to uh, smaller rural areas in that, uh, that which don't have uh, fac larger facilities for the cold storage as well, so you can keep it colder longer. Uh, a long winter is coming, and with that, uh, it's flu season, so just because we are uh, in the middle of a pandemic doesn't mean the flu is going to take a break as well and that health officials are asking folks at home to get their flu shot. And part of this is to uh, reduce the amount of uh, traffic coming in and out of hospitals. Hospitals are at capacity in many areas, um, including uh, South Dakota. Uh, known for not enforcing any kind of uh, mask mandate or having any kind of closures, South Dakota has become one of the highest risks or per deaths per capita in the world. Um, it has a population of 884,000 with uh, about 68,000 cumulative COVID cases. Governor Kristi Noem from South Dakota has been known to be critical of lockdowns and during a press conference Wednesday said that they had no plans to have any shutdowns regardless of questions from the media that referenced a John Hopkins study suggesting South Dakota has the highest death rate in the world currently. No mentions. Uh, in response that there are 41 states that have had mask mandates that are seeing peak numbers as well moving forward into the uh, flu and winter seasons. Of course, uh, there's just something to think about in the state of Montana as we are moving more and more towards a red state as our uh, governor, uh, Steve Bullock, will be passing on powers to uh, uh, Greg Gianforte, uh, the news of him p pulling together a COVID task force. Um, geared towards finding cold storage in the state of Montana is moving forward. Um, and another big thing that's happening in Missoula is that, uh, with some public library news, is that uh, KPAX did a story not too long ago about the need for blood. So if you are interested in donating to blood, the Missoula Public Library is hosting a blood drive in Missoula on December 9th. Uh, donors have a chance to win an outdoor living experience powered by propane. Prize uh, includes a propane-owned pizza oven, fire pit, outdoor heater, and stipend towards propane. The KPEX story ran last week, and you can watch that on KPEX.com. Uh, of course, you know, let's see. Okay, so that's about it for all your uh, news items. And up next, we got a... Another promo I'm going to show you guys uh, featuring our new location at the new library. I've been showing this a lot, but here it is again. MCAT is Missoula's community media resource. MCAT offers equipment like camera rentals and training like instruction. 
and distribution help like cable TV channels, starting your own YouTube channel, a short clip for Instagram or Facebook. MCAT helps people who want to make TV shows, social media clips, and podcasts. In our new home, in the Missoula Public Library, MCAT will be offering classes in camera use, getting the best sound and lighting quality, how to use a multi-camera studio with green screen and other special effects. In addition, we will be teaching video editing on popular platforms like iMovie, Final Cut Pro, and Adobe Premiere. For kiddos, we offer animation classes, along with other multimedia activities for after school, during the weekend, and summer camps. MCAT has been serving the Missoula community for over 30 years with the material and the guidance to let your creative side blossom in audio-visual video. Be sure to visit us on the first floor of the new Missoula Public Library. Hey guys, welcome back. And now it's time for a little segment I like to call Pre-Critic. This is where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing. A TV series, streaming show, a new game. Just a, a critic show where it's based on absolutely nothing at all. We're kicking things off with a Jackie Chan movie. Guard your kids, guard your nerves. Guard your vans. Vanguard is a movie that stars Jackie Chan in a Chinese published movie where he pr his production duty gets kind of out of hand and he must use kung fu, or no, karate, no, kung fu, yeah, that's right, kung fu to fight and he basically kind of fights his way up to the final boss like he's done in a lot of his movies, um, especially the ones that are published out of uh, Ch uh, China as well, if you've ever seen a lot of his. Because uh, he has a, a, a series of uh, movies that are kind of like, it's the Chinese James Bond movies. I can't think of it at the top of my head. I'm kind of going off script. But anyways, um, I have no issues with Jackie Chan or his movies, but that's what you can expect from his films. Um, especially moving forward is where he's pushed over the edge and must overcome uh, to uh, Van Guard. All right, but let's move on. Here's another show that I actually watched, so I can't really prejudge it. But I'm going to do it anyways. Season 4 of The Crown. Last Sunday, uh, there's a lot to talk about. The the opening, the reopening of the old wound of Princess Diana as she uh, gets married to Prince Charles in a fictional uh, depiction of their marriage and the fictional depiction of the royal family from basically when uh, Queen Elizabeth II becomes queen up until present date. Um, I believe that next uh, season will be all about uh, a certain tunnel that she uh, she died in. All right, moving on. As many uh, monarchs fell over the years, Britain stays strong and pure to the bloodline. So pure, they have a whole episode devoted to the fact that they have inbred cousins that are just kind of living in an insane asylum. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. But um, their parents, uh, siblings, um, uncle parents. Uh, okay, I don't want to get too much into it. I watched the whole series. And uh, this shouldn't really count towards a pre-critic anyways, but, uh, okay. So this whole kind of series, they kind of dive into Margaret Thatcher's um, rise and fall during her um, eight, uh, 79 to uh, 1990 prime ministership, one of the longest prime ministerships, and one of the first uh, women to be prime minister of the grand old country of the United Kingdoms, uh, England. Um, anyways... But you'll get distracted by wanting the relationship between Charles and Diana to work out. Um, oh, I hope it does work out in the next season. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be too cold, but this is pretty critic. All right, Call of Duty, Black Ops, Cold War. Speaking of the 80s, 80s seems to be a big thing with a lot of people these days. Because, hey, why not? They're, uh, they're not kids anymore. They have money and they want to spend on things that remind them of them when they were kids. There he is. There's uh, 80s in a nutshell uh, for modern day. Uh, Call of Duty, haha! -ha! Black Ops Cold War. Um, if you like those games where you play online with those uh, tween kids who have a really foul mouth, hey, here's another uh, game in that installment. But this time you gotta hang out with Ronald Reagan. I don't know why I said that voice. We're just a uh, whole. Oh, go on to Cold War and watch those Ruskies. 
yeah, you gotta fight them. You gotta watch them. You know, we got just a bluster of bullies fighting one another. Uh, so anyways, the uh, U.S. has only been known to use nuclear weapons during war. Uh, World War B. World War III will be fought with nukes. World War IV will be fought with sticks. I'll move on forward as we dive into the world of espionage, backstabbing, cloak and dagger, black ops type stuff during uh, video games. Oh yeah, by the way, this is a video game. <laughs> I should have mentioned this. Sounds like a movie, right? What's the difference? Uh, but uh, basically, uh, just kind of like the Jackie Chan movie Vanguard, you finally fight your way up to the final boss and you escape. Uh, with the skin of your teeth, and you save the day, and Ronald Reagan's like, Good job. I'm proud of you. Old Nancy. I gotta go check on old Nancy. Take care, everyone. And then, you know, fight evil commies. The game. America. Use America powers. 80s were cool. Um, it's rated in for mature. Um, so, you know, <laughs> just be careful when your kids are gonna buy it. Uh, Alexa. Purchase... Uh, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. Gotcha! <laughs> Alright, so uh, that concludes my pre-critic for you guys. I have a dub and stuff for you guys as well, which tackles the 1951 uh, movie, uh, St. Benny the Dip. And then when I come back, I'm going to talk about some city council. Getting stuck in this room. Ugh, this guy over here. You know it. How long do you expect us to wait like this? As long as it takes. Kids' birthday parties are such a sham. Oh, excuse me? We must not forget the greatest birthday of all. Ah, I know what you're talking about. And besides, we got a nice wreath for them. It is pretty nice. See? Look how beautiful it is. Lots of flowers and stuff. Yeah, 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 I get it. Flowers and stuff. Hmm. You pay quite a penny for this thing. Seems like you're trying a little hard on a single mother's child. The birth of any child is very special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As common courtesy, I will let you... How could you do something like that? Listen, fellas, we can't stay here for too long. The storms are coming. We can't stay here for too long. Uh, yeah. Let's think about our next option. Why do I even bother with you two? Hmm. Ah. We might have to run for it. We just have to stay quiet. I told you this was a bad place to hide. Now come on, let's get going. Whoop -a -doop -a. Sneak, sneak, sneak. A sneak, sneak, sneak. Make sure nobody sees me. A sneak, sneak, sneak. A sneak, sneak, sneak. A sneak! Oh, it's too bright. Oh, uh, were you... God, will you keep it down? I'm trying I'm my trying best to relax, okay? Ugh, I've had a bad day. First, I stubbed my toe, I lost my favorite sock, and then I found my favorite sock in my pants, but then I have three pairs of socks and only have two feet. This is ridiculous. I hate it. Yeah, yeah, you got problems. Ugh, can you just go to sleep? You know, I'm really surprised that you can even sleep in this thunder. Well, it'd be a lot easier if it was darker in here. Would you like me to play some soothing music? Like what? Jazz? Very funny. I'm gonna play something like Hoobastank, if you don't mind. It's a good band. They have some great songs. I found a reason for you, uh, Crawling in the Dark, and other things. Oh, you can't be serious. This is, uh, that's a horrible band. Well, they were formed in the 90s, and they still are pretty well, active Well, if they're today. so active, how come they haven't made anything? Well, of course they've made things. They've already made all sorts of music and stuff. Uh, but... Anything of noteworthy? I happen to know that they released a, you know, a song on YouTube just recently, and it's pretty good. Doesn't sound too much like a lot of their old stuff, but still, I think it's pretty good. Oh, please. No, let me take the light. Rain, rain, go away. Come back another day. For today is a new day. Even though it's three in the morning, I can expect that this rain will stop.
Hey guys, there was no city council meeting on Monday, but we did have two committee meetings that I really wanted to um, um, harp on. And one of them was a Committee of the Whole and uh, Public Safety and Health, both of which were talking about Learn Missoula, which is talking about race relations and race and the systemic racism within uh, local government and seeing what kind of uh, information they can gather from it. Um, during Public Safety and Health, they talk more about the mobile crisis unit and how it can be implemented and how it impl started being implemented on Monday. But we're going to get into that a little bit more. That's just a little teaser, but let's jump right into Committee of the Whole. The city talks about money that they reallocated to Learn Missoula, which looks at Missoula's equity within the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, structural racism within city government will look into uh, this through organizations that is spearheaded by the BIPOC community members in Missoula. Um, from what I remember, the city allocated $100,000 for this plan, which added to the uh, sum total of $387,000 for this project moving forward. Part of the funding was from the Indian Health Center, uh, Aaron PM, PN, Housing and Community Development Talks Goals. All of this work requires the generation of knowledge directly from the BIPOC community. BIPOC-centered solutions and action steps to provide us with a path ahead and a deeper understanding of our data at the city of Missoula, what we collect, how we collect it, and perhaps just as importantly, what we don't collect today. We need this information to better understand the experiences of BIPOC's interaction with local government systems, services, and programs. This is the foundational work that we need to move ahead. However, we're not looking to this project um, as a standalone solution to further our equity work. There are many things that the city of Missoula can and should be doing right now alongside things that might fall outside of this work. For instance, addressing our goals around social equity. There will also be some areas that are identified through the Learn Missoula proposal that we want to take a deeper dive on and look at more thoroughly. So it's important that we recognize this is only one piece of the puzzle, but it is an essential piece of the puzzle. All right, so here are the main goals. Uh, history from BIPOC communities, how other communities have come up with uh, uh, solutions through certain challenges of systemic racism, what knowledge can bring about change, uh, deeper understandings in municipal government departments, data, and recommend changes based on data collected. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laurel C. Warner, clinical social worker uh, with Walla Walla Washington branch here in Missoula, uh, is helping on this project. There is indeed structural inequality. We are coming from the premise that uh, we live in a society where whiteness is centered um, and it's, it's nothing about whether or not people are bad. It isn't, it's a systemic issue. So we are coming at that. So our research isn't intended to prove that that exists. Our research is focused on, now that we know this exists, what is it that BIPOC are experiencing? Taking that anecdotal information and codifying it in a very rigorous way. And finally, asking for how to go about creating solutions so that we can all live in a place where there is equity and justice. So for those of you know, who uh, just a little bit of background for this, uh, Learn Missoula, part of this was an outcry of, of, of justice for George Floyd that happened uh, many, many uh, months ago. It seems like it happened like forever ago, but it's something that's still really uh, crucial and really th to think about moving forward and uh, putting feelers and they had a, a kind of an ad hoc meeting where they uh, had an, uh, the city of Missoula invited people in the public to speak and a lot of it, uh, uh, they wanted to put out feelers for the BIPOC community in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. Uh, most of this was to create a master plan in Missoula to look for solutions when working with members of the BIPOC co uh, community by having them spearhead the uh, Learn Missoula program that was initiated. So far, this is all for data collection, using anecdotal data to uh, comprehensive collect uh, stories and figure out themes of these particular stories and how they can uh, find the root of systemic racism in the community. Many questions from council were, how are they going to go about this process? Uh, they spent a lot of time talking in circles, uh, but the main point, Learn Missoula, 
has to gather information and people to compile resources that can follow certain themes and of systemic racism. So Jamar Galbraith, Associate Director from Empower Montana, speaks on this. Um, and so that's also uh, just the uh, operating from the understanding that different places may require and different communities may require different solutions. And so really just challenging the notion of a universal needle moving um, and being able to just make sure that we're able to operate solutions um, from, from within by engaging populations within there. Um, some of these results may look different, um, but that's, you know, why we're doing now uh, why we're doing this work. One of the major things that Learn Missoula has to do is invite and encourage members of the BIPOC community and culture to uh, measure racial equity. Uh, Dr. Warner speaks again on this. It becomes really important to recognize and use the word organizational culture. That absolutely, that will be part of what we will be looking at. But um, part of what we are hoping for is to help departments engage in and develop this very internal reflexive process of scrutinizing their data and, and, and having a very um, natural feedback loop that exists where they will be questioning about internal practices, internal decision making through an equity and inclusion lens. And that's part of what we are hoping that we will be able to bring into departments as well. So there are many stories and many anecdotes in racism in the Missoula community, but not enough information on the themes and elements that can pinpoint where the uh, issues of race stem. So you, you can't really solve a problem in which you find the root of the issue as well. So that's what they want to do. And so that kind of kind of concludes this segment of the uh, community of the whole. Um, I'm going to move on to public safety and health now. Public safety and health jumps right into the fire department and the mobile health, uh, mobile crisis unit, and this is geared towards de-escalating situations when people have a mental health crisis. So Brad Davis, Assistant Fire Chief, kicks off the meeting and the topic on launching the mobile crisis unit just this week. Monday was the first day um, with our mobile support teams going live. They responded to their first calls yesterday, or excuse me, on Monday of this week. And so we don't have um, a lot of data to present to you at this time. We just got going on, on Monday. And and I just wanted to take an opportunity to, to field any questions and just kind of talk about the program a little bit with you guys. Um, it's been uh, it's been a whirlwind. Um, it's been nothing short of miraculous what our uh, our admin team at Partnership Health Center and and our team of EMTs and licensed um, counselors have been able to do. And Randy kind of leading that charge in this short amount of time to be able to purchase equipment, um, onboard personnel training, um, drafting protocols and procedures, trying to get this thing up and running in really just two months, possibly. I mean, I guess looking at two months. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. And, and uh, we were able to get the van um, on its first run on Monday. So that was pretty exciting. Um, Through Partnership Health Center, um, Mont Missoula EMTs and Fire Department providing mobile crisis unit for a softer touch when it comes to handling mental health crises and also uh, a follow-up. That's one of the big things that uh, they want to do with this mobile crisis unit is to provide a follow-up for individuals who've had a mental health crises, but going back there to touch base and have people from Partnership Health, uh, social kind of work um, to help these individuals kind of see how they're going and just a more of a kind of touch base within the community. Um, Spokane has also had a unit they've been doing for about three years. It's called their Behavioral Health Response Unit. Um, and Missoula reps went over there to kind of learn about how they do their thing and what they brought back here for more information moving forward as well. This is a pilot program, which uh, at the end must prove of its effectiveness. You know, the numbers have to come in as it goes. It's a, it's a very uh, freshman program, so you have to let it graduate over time and collect the data. Brad uh, Davis speaks again to the limited funding hours, which is from 8 a.m. from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. for this program. And since this program is not available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and the possibility that these units can be busy on other calls, even during the time of day when they are staffed. And when that occurs, um, essentially what will happen is, is fire EMS or law enforcement or the appropriate agency will respond to this individual in crisis or in need. And we have a, we've built a referral process where they can, it's a quick QR scan where the, the police officer or the EMT can scan it 
and it sends a referral to our Missoula CARES program. So then we can follow up with that individual the next day when we come on um, to ship. And so, and if, if that's not an option, if we have to transport them to a higher level of care, then we'll transport them to the emergency department like we've done um, for years and years. But we're hoping that with the referral system that we'll have in place and the follow-up and trying to get these mobile support teams out and, and interacting with individuals while they're not in crisis can hopefully deter some of that crisis um, occurrences by being ahead of it and preloading that with our follow-up and referral system and getting them into the appropriate resources to help with that. But um, that is the option right now. If it's after hours is, is the, the first responders that are interacting um, have a very quick and easy way to refer that patient to our program so we can follow up and meet their needs um, the following day. A big part of these hours be geared towards the follow-up, like I said. Um, a lot of times, if you have a mental health uh, issue that are happening after these hours, a lot of the dispatcher will um, tell you to uh, uh, get, will give you a referral. And part of this is that they'll give you a follow-up with the mobile crisis unit. It will follow up with you the next day between their work hours. It's not a 24-7 thing. It's just not funded to be that way, unfortunately. Um, they're, but they're trying to uh, best um, uh, help and do right by the people. The time is based on other models and other communities that, uh, where they see higher numbers of mental health crises within the community. Uh, the mobile response program was able to expand and of course we'll get another unit van for dispatch so so far in Missoula there's two. Uh, Randy O'Conn program manager for the CARES program talks about recent experience with the police and homeless woman who had a mental health crisis in which uh, which officers responded first. So our, our first patient uh, was a, a well-known person in our community uh, that uh, is, is homeless um, and our contact was through the police department was the request of a police officer, one of the downtown uh, business district officers um, requested us uh, and we were able to come and visit with that person and deescalate uh, that this the person's state. Um, and through that visit, we learned that the medications that the person needed to, uh, to uh, mentally well was sitting at uh, a pharmacy and because of some problems with the transportation she wasn't able to get transportation out to that so we arranged that the pickup of the medications um, and then yesterday those were delivered and understand through some other people that had contact with her that today she's in a much better state um, mentally um, able to manage herself um, and be a, a member of our community um, and not utilize the 911 system so I think, uh, I think the officers have had great contact with the person um, and would have gotten to that position just through our resources, especially going back to that case, case facilitator point. That helps us do that facilitation portion. Um, and then what it really did in, in that specific case was allow two uh, police officers to clear that earlier while we spent about 30 minutes with the patient. Um, it all begins with dispatch. You always call 911, whether it is a huge emergency which you may need police or a, uh, or a mental health crisis in which you need a softer touch and you just need some help with uh, an issue that's happening. Um, and 911 is still the number that you guys can call to get your uh, mental health crisis unit to come in and help you. And if they can't help you that day, they can always follow up with you the next day and they work with Partnership Health moving forward as well. Uh, so one of the things that Randy O'Conn, one of the questions within the uh, city uh, council were talking about the issue that, uh, the situation, mind you, that happened with Kale Brown a couple Saturdays ago. So this is what Randy O'Conn talks about in the, in the result of the shooting death of Kale Brown. That was a very quickly escalated scene. Um, definitely if we would have chosen a different model and, and one of our clinicians was the first one to open that door, um, it wouldn't have been a good scene. Uh, we, we just don't have the abilities to uh, protect ourselves to, to de-escalate in that fashion. Um, so, and it, and it evolves so quickly that I don't see an opportunity for us to have been, you know, staged and then come and, and take a positive effect on that scene. So here is Stacy Anderson, 
clarifies emergency response followed by uh, Brad Davis. If you were with somebody who you feel is in crisis that would be best served by the mobile crisis unit, it's not calling a separate number. It's still calling 911. And then the normal processes of dispatching of um, fire and police will come and assess the situation and then request the mobile crisis unit. So there isn't, um, for those in the public and just to understand, a separate number to access the mobile crisis unit is still 911 is the uh, point of contact for anyone who's having crisis in our community and then that the responders will then assess what's best needed, correct? Yes, Stacy, and that is correct. And I, there's been a lot of conversation on this response model. And I just want to make sure that I, I say this out loud for the public and for, for the council members as well, is as we're, as we're approaching this, we're approaching it with, the, with safety on as, as being the first part of our, our, our priority. And but we are also, um, you are correct, is 911 is the number to call right now. We talked about a separate line typically a separate line, even though it's a different phone number, still rings to 911 dispatch and the same individual answers that phone that answers the 911 call. And we decided that 911 is a number everybody knows and is the number to access the system. So those are all your quotes. Uh, part of this will create a system response that will provide safety, not only to people in need, but the people helping them as well. Brad Davis said that they want to err on the side of caution, public safety and health of not only the individuals that they help, but the individuals who go to help the individuals who need help. I know I'm, that, that's, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a lot of help, help, but that's just something that they want to make sure that everyone's safe moving forward and ha when they move to that softer touch in which these mobile crisis units will be moving forward towards. The rest of the meeting was devoted to that flavor ban on tobacco, and I'm going to spare you guys on that. If you are more interested in learning more about local government, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us for all that information and more. Uh, up next, we'll have your latest COVID update in Missoula. Hi, my name is Cindy Farn. I'm the Incident Commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Monday, November 16th, and the SIR... COVID briefing. I just want to say sorry I missed you all the last couple of weeks. I took a week off and um, then last week I was extremely busy trying to get caught up on everything that I missed during the week that I was gone. So now we should get back to having regular briefings. So we've now had 3,604 cumulative positive COVID-19 cases in Missoula County to date with 255 new cases since Friday. We've had 36 deaths associated with COVID-19 to date. Currently, 18 Missoula County residents and 18 non-county residents do remain hospitalized in Missoula County. We now have 1,076 active COVID-19 cases with an average of 5.4 close contacts per case. Those active cases and their identified close contacts remain in isolation and quarantine and are being supported as needed. Remember that all of these numbers, as well as the graphs and figures associated and additional information is um, on our website at MissoulaInfo.com. The state of Montana is reporting 48,027 cumulative COVID-19 cases, which is up 869 new cases since yesterday. There are now 20,009 active cases in the state of Montana with 453 active hospitalizations across the state. There have been 522 deaths related to COVID-19 statewide. The University of Montana has had 394 cumulative UM associated cases since the beginning of fall semester, which is up seven since yesterday. And there are currently 60 active cases associated with the University of Montana. Just a reminder that the University of Montana's fall semester is coming to a close with the last day of fall semester being next Wednesday, um, the November 25th. So I have a couple of things to talk about today. First, I want to let you know where we are in terms of indicators. The goal with the increased restrictions was to get our average daily incidence rate to 25 cases per 100,000 people or below for two consecutive weeks. Currently, we are at 78 cases per 100,000 people in Missoula County. With that, I want to let everyone know that there is a public meeting of the Missoula County Board of Health. They will be considering staff recommendations to implement restrictions such as those covered under the most recent health officer orders. Um, that Board of Health meeting is going to be on Thursday from 1215 until 3, and it will be put out as a public notice. It is a Microsoft Teams meeting if you want to um, join in either by phone or computer. 
the comments um, that we, if you would like to make comments on the action on of the Board of Health on Thursday, please go to MissoulaInfo.com and use our feedback portal to submit your comments. The comments that are helpful for informing the Board of Health are those comments letting us know if you support current restrictions, think there should be further restrictions, or if you think there should be less restrictions. Our communication staff will be reviewing the comments that come in prior to 5 p.m. tomorrow, Tuesday evening, and compiling an analysis for the Board of Health to present to them at that Thursday meeting. Another announcement that I'd like to make is related to testing. While we have had the capacity to offer testing to clo all close contacts up until now, we are no longer have the capacity to do that. For easy math, I'm gonna round today's numbers. If we have a thousand active cases and each case has 5.4 close contacts, that's 5,400 close contacts total. We currently have the capacity to test around 150 people per day at our drive through testing facility. Our appointments have been booking up really fast with people who are having symptoms. So for now, we will continue offering anyone with symptoms a test and anyone who's a close contact that is having symptoms will also be able to get tested. But asymptomatic close contacts will not be offered a test at our testing facility for now. Once the numbers start to come down, we expect that we will be able to go back to testing all close contacts. We just don't have that capacity right now. Lastly, we've been asked a lot, where are these cases and where are these clusters? As we've been saying for a while now, we are giving it to each other. Many new cases are people who developed COVID-19 after being a close contact to someone who tested positive. Right now, we're seeing clusters of cases associated with parties such as Halloween or election parties. We see workplace clusters, um, particularly in small or sh smaller or shared office spaces where employees really work in close proximity to one another. We're seeing cases that are spread through overnight getaways with non-household members and specifically people catching it from traveling in a vehicle with a non-household member. So just remember that it's important to pr practice social distancing, frequent hand washing, and wearing a mask or cloth face covering if you're going to be within six feet of anyone outside of your immediate household. So that's it for my briefing for today. As always, you can subscribe to me on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. -R. Click that notification bell so you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. You can check out our website at MissoulaInfo.com. There's lots of great information there. You can just click across the tabs at the top of the page. Um, you can check us out on Facebook under the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page, and you can call 258-INFO if you'd like more information about COVID-19 or if you'd like to schedule a test if you are having symptoms of COVID-19. So until next time, everyone stay healthy. Well, it's the weekend, folks, and uh, a couple things that MCAT's going to be doing this weekend as well is that we're going to do a live stream of the Hellgate High School Jazz Band, and if we don't have the live stream available right away, I'm going to make it my damnedest to make sure it goes on our YouTube channel, so we're going to try to stray try to stream live on YouTube tonight, Friday, November 20th, and this is their jazz concert just before the holidays. Um, part of this is that with social distancing and um, reducing the number of people, it's uh, it's going to be a very interesting kind of thing and dynamic. MCAT has done a couple live streams for a couple events within the community as well. MCPS, um, we've been working a lot with MCPS with a lot of their um, pilot um, virtual meetings and stuff like that and streaming them on our Facebook and our YouTube page as well. And another big thing that's happening as well is every Saturday, uh, MCAT's been doing uh, some Z the Zach streams. So they call them the social distancing sessions. The upcoming show, I believe, is on November 21st. It is Zootown Cabaret. So it's a kind of a cornucopia. Uh, yes, cornucopia. It's the, this is the word of the day. Uh, it's a cornucopia of music, acting, dance, show. Uh, family fun entertainment all happening from about 7.30 to about 9.30 and it's going to be on um, MCAT's, uh, well actually uh, Zach's uh, Facebook and YouTube and then also allocated to MCAT's local live page. Um, you can go to MCAT.org for more information about programs or if you have a program that you want MCAT to record, you guys can do that as well. You go to uh, services and you click on request event recording and we'll be able to help you with that depending upon it. We always ask that you call ahead, you get in contact with us beforehand. Our phones, just so you guys know, are up and operational. Uh, we, we were having 
uh, some issues with their phones, but officially now, MCAT, you can call MCAT in. We're not doing checkouts right now, unfortunately. Uh, we're still waiting on the the big opening for the public, and it's going to be a very limited opening regardless of vaccines and stuff like that. But all I know is that the new opening date is January, and I'm not married to that any more than I've been married to every other opening date that the uh, <laughs> that we looked into. But yeah, that's kind of what's happening there. So far, uh, there's a couple other shows. They, uh ESP Backyard Album release show is also happening the first Saturday in December. The Corey Fay and the Good... God damn, uh, it's going to be playing on Saturday, December 12th. And then they got John Brownell to wrap up the uh, 2020 uh, uh, social distancing session from the Zach. Um, part of this is that they're always looking to donate online so they can keep these sessions going. Uh, you can't go to these sessions, but you can go online to watch these sessions on YouTube and Facebook. And it's all free with uh, suggested donations for anybody who wants to support the arts here in the city of Missoula and also extremely local bands because this has been a great uh, prethra of uh, local band emergings, emergence back into our community. Uh, we've had a lot of big shows that had to cancel events in the city of Missoula, but this has been a good way for a lot of entertainers to kind of uh, shake off the dust here locally in Missoula. Um, uh, yeah, what else do I need to tell you guys? Um, there's really not much to say, but I, I did want to thank you guys for joining me as well. Uh, but I did also want to mention just before I go is that, uh, they're doing the, uh, basically the, uh, drive through of lights, uh, formerly, uh, known as the parade of lights. They're not going to do a parade of lights, but they're going to have a lot of, uh, of the vehicles that would be in the parade of lights parked. And so they are, uh, letting people drive through, uh, I believe it's going to be on Arthur Street at the University of Montana. I'm hopefully going to be able to... Uh, bring uh, the MCAT drone over to get a nice overview of the shot, weather permitted, of course. And it's going to be from about 6 to, I think, 8, 9 o'clock. And if you haven't already been downtown in the city of Missoula, you might have seen that they're uh, testing the lights of the, the ye old uh, lighting of the Christmas tree in the downtown Missoula, or holiday tree, depending on how you uh, feel about that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, once again, thank you guys for joining me for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp. Take care and have a good weekend.